Hey hey everyone, back again. Now we're on to part two of Spinoza's Ethics. Go check out part one if you just happened to land here. If you did happen to just land here, like I said, go check out part one. If you found this as a podcast, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube, where I sometimes have videos. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it as a podcast, where there shouldn't be any ads, which is great, right? Um, if you like what I do here, like, share, subscribe. Tell me if I get anything wrong. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, without further ado, let's jump into this because we have a lot of ground to cover. So we're starting from part two of ethics, and this is our part two. And then next week, we'll part three, and then part four. You know how it works. Part two titled On the Nature and Origin of the Mind. So after having established in the first part that God is tantamount to the infinite also being synonymous with nature, uh, he has demonstrated that we have to reckon with our capacity to engage with nature and ourselves as a part of it. So here he's going to turn from considering God, which is the focus of part one, to now considering human interaction with nature and the world in our minds and, and how our minds relate to it. So it's important to remind you that as humans, we are only privy to, we are only, we can only access two of God's infinite attributes, but we don't perceive them really, we don't experience them in their infinity, we only experience almost instances, specific utterances of this broader infinite, and they are, these infinite attributes are thought and extension, or the body, or really space and time, you might be able to say, but mind and body is how we are going to classify it here. Or mind and extension is the word we find in the English translation that I was using. So this part looks at the mind-body split, and this whole part, part two, is going to problematize the mind-body split. So here he's going to take aim at Descartes. He was very much fond of Descartes. He very much, he, you know, a lot of Spinoza really originates from Descartes, but here he's going to problematize the neat split we find in Descartes between our mind and our body, where Spinoza is going to tell us that we can't so neatly do that because our body is the way our mind actually receives information about the world. We can't just so neatly say that the mind can just exist on its own, just in the act of thinking, because that variability is dependent upon us having a body. You can't be a mind on its own. You must have this body. So we can't just separate it. In fact, he thinks, he almost thinks it's disrespectful to the body to just issue it, to just be like, oh, we can get rid of it. And just like the last part, this is very, uh, you know, this, this part is broken down into sections that are pretty much just lists. So here we're going to begin with our definition section. So number one, a body. How does he define a body? A body is a mode which expresses, in a certain and determinate manner, the essence of God insofar as he is considered as the thing extended. So a body belonging to the universe, it exists in all of, like, nature, in all possible things, is therefore one expression, one moment, of the broader extension of God itself, as nature, as infinite. And as being one expression, and therefore not being infinite, because a body is not infinite, it is determinate. It only occupies a certain amount of space in an otherwise infinite expanse of space. Okay, second definition. Essence and existence. Essence is embodied in a thing. One can't exist without the other. Or anything is going to have an essence. You can't have a thing exist that exists for no purpose or according to nothing. Just by virtue of existing, it belongs already to God's extension, so therefore it must have some kind of purpose to exist. It doesn't just exist for no reason, and it doesn't just come to the earth. It doesn't just exist from nothing. Now remember, though, we can have an essence without necessarily having, having an existence. So the example we gave last time was the case of humanity. Humanity has an essence. This doesn't necessarily mean that all humans that can be created, that can be birthed, will be birthed. Only some of them will be birthed as per, like, chance. If Maybe maybe it's not chance. Maybe, maybe in Spinoza's words, chance doesn't really fit in here. But of all the possibilities, 
all the possible different configurations of humans, only some will actually manage to exist. So each of those existing humans has an essence belonging to humanity, but uh, you can have an essence without necessarily having an existence or a realization of that essence. Okay, third definition, idea. An idea is the mind's, well, the mind's creation separate from a perception that is only passive perception of an object through senses. So if I'm looking at my computer, I, you know, I'm passively replicating that image in my brain of, of the computer. An idea is something that is created separate from our passive perception of, of an object in the world. So it's something that comes about through our minds on its own or through our mind on its own, not through necessarily having an immediate external stimulation that provides an idea for me. And that puts us into the fourth definition of what he calls an adequate idea. This is an idea without recourse to another idea or to an external object, but that is considered in itself and so possesses properties of a true idea. So I think geometry can work here like a triangle. Triangles don't really exist in nature. You don't really find them. They're largely human created, at least a perfect triangle, three sides, uh, three perfectly connected sides. Uh, with angles that all equal up to 180 degrees and therefore corresponds to the Pythagoras theorem, Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, Pythagoras, the th whatever. So in this case, we have an idea that doesn't necessarily point to any external stimulation, but that is true in itself nevertheless, and its truth is bound up with itself. So we know the properties of a triangle, it having three sides, it being 180 degrees in total, it having, you know, it can correspond to these other formulae. And so in this case, we have an object that is almost pure as an idea without necessarily existing in the world. And here we have an adequate idea. Number five, or the fifth definition, duration is the indefinite continuation of existence. That is, existence itself continuing for a time. Duration. Easy enough. Number six, reality and perfection. Where here he says that they are the same thing. That's all he wants to say is reality and perfection are the same thing. There's nothing that happens in the world because everything is according to God, is of God. Everything is therefore perfect. Everything happens for a reason. You know, as you've probably heard in your life, you know, that everything happens for a reason. The idea here being that nothing can not abide by nature's laws and principles. Otherwise, it wouldn't wouldn't be it, it wouldn't make sense it wouldn't it wouldn't exist that puts us here into the final definition an individual thing so things that are finite and which have a determinate existence like any object he adds that if many individual things or people work together to produce a single effect they're all one thing so this is an interesting qualification that he makes because when he's talking about an individual thing he really just means any individual thing in the world it can be like your phone, if you have a phone, can be your computer or whatever, your hat, doesn't matter. But the extra qualification he makes here, that if many people are working in union to produce something, or let's say many bees work to make a hive, these bees are in unison and they form a unit in their having created this thing. Now, I'm not totally sure why he includes this added detail because I'm not sure how it fits into the totality here of the of the the rest of the book, what instances we find. What we'll get later on is a firm belief that as humans we have an obligation to work together with others and to limit harm to others and to maximize our abilities to work together. So perhaps this is like a way to conceptualize humanity as a single unit working together towards a single goal. What will come to be will be to in increase uh, our propensity for action, to increase our propensity to act and to furnish uh, a better relationship, furnish to cultivate a better relationship with God. And that puts us here into the axioms. So axiom number one, 
humanity's essence doesn't require any one person's existence. People will die and then people will be born. So this is what I mentioned earlier. You can have a human essence without necessarily having existence. Not every human will exist. The second axiom, humans think. The third axiom, a mode of thinking like love or desire depend on the idea of a thing that is loved or desired without having another mode of thought. So in itself, that is ac uh, adequate, having these uh, these modes of thinking like love or desire. And we'll talk more about this, I think in the fourth part, when we talk about emotions, we're going to talk a lot about love and desire for Spinoza. Number four, bodies are affected in many ways. Really, simp simply enough. And finally, number five, we only feel and perceive bodies and modes of thought. So what he's saying here is that as humans, we are only privy to these two attributes. Again, mind or thought and extension, mind and body. And so we can only feel and perceive bodies and modes of thought. Whatever else there might exist in the universe that we just don't have access to, we can't actually like, we can't access it. <laughs> simply enough. We can only access uh, and perceive things as they exist as physical bodies or as modes of thought. And that puts us here into the meat of the part of this part, and that is our propositions. So proposition number one, thought is an attribute of God or God is a thinking thing. The idea here being that because we have the capacity to think of an infinite being, our thinking is the infinite, is the finite, sorry. Our thinking is a finite expression of God's infinite attribute of thought. So our thinking in any given moment is just one moment of the broader continuum, the infinite expanse of all possible thinking gifted to us by the nature of nature itself, by God being or existing within God's universe or just simply the universe. Proposition two extension is an attribute of God or God is an extended thing. So this is the exact same thing as the last point, except not referring to thought, but referring to extension to space. We are one moment in an infinite expanse of space. Proposition three, in God, there necessarily exists the idea of his essence and of all things which necessarily follow from his essence. So that is to say that because God can think of infinite things at once, it has the full grasp of and is synonymous with those infinite attributes and things. So God is the exact same as the idea of his essence and of all things which necessarily follow from him. And this is an important point because against just straight up like scripture, God does not is not this like humanoid figure for Spinoza sitting on a cloud who's just thinking like, oh, what will I do today? Or if anyone has read the Bible, you'll know that God is one, uh, it flip-flops quite a bit. God is always having different ideas about how society and how the world should should run itself. If you actually read the Bible, he, you know, he destroys humanity how many times? Like he clearly wants, it's, anyways. We have to separate ourselves from that conception of God into one that considers nature itself as being God. So everything that exists, everything that can possibly exist is of God or of nature, which is really the point of this definition. And everything is in accordance with his essence, his, the God man. <laughs> it's funny. We have to, we have to not anthropomorphize, but yet it's his, his, his. Okay, so proposition number four, God's idea while infinite only appears as one. And that is the same with our idea of God. So God as the totality of all of nature is just one entity. We can't just split it up into many different gods, which is obviously problematic for any people who believe in multiple gods, but you know, Spinoza. So the idea here is that God is one, even if they are infinite. And the infinite intellect perceives many of God's attributes and modifications, but always as only one single unitary thing, as it's 
you know, as its own essence. Proposition five, the mind identifies God as its cause only insofar as God is conceived as a thinking thing and whose thought originates in itself. So what this means is that thought is only reliant on thought as an attribute, as an attribute of God, and so emerges from God as a thinking thing and not as having been conditioned by thought itself. But it's interesting here because if God supplies us with the possibility for thought and God only exists in our minds that we have to like argue for, so Spinoza here clearly arguing for a certain idea about God that is different from almost all ideas of God before Spinoza, and many people would have different ideas afterwards. It's just interesting that we can try to sidestep this by saying like, oh, God just gives us the very capacity for thought itself. So even in those variations that God exists, we can still find this common thread in our ability to think itself as being a sign of God. So even if we have different ideas, it doesn't matter because we have this like transcendent idea about what connects us to God, the single one that stands above the rest. And we see this in uh, certainly in Descartes as well, where the, the mind is what, you know, is the thing that can't go away, we cannot doubt. So here we find an extension of that while being cautious, of course, while leaving room to acknowledge the place of the body. But in any case, I just think it's interesting that the mind is the arena, the playground in which we try to furnish, we try to develop a relationship with God. But it's, always, it's, it's a very isolating experience because we always have, the, everyone has a different idea. It's just, I don't know. And now I'm just stream of consciousness. It's not useful to you. <laughs> okay, number six. Number six. All modes have God as a cause only so far as they are ascribed to attributes that are tethered to God. So what he means here is that all attributes are conceived on their own and so only have God as a cause. So a mode being an extension, a specific type of extension, like I'm, my example is I'm six feet tall. That's my extent, that's my mode of extension of space taking. And so here we have to still acknowledge that that is possible because of God. God provided us this capacity to even take up space, to have a mode that is a mode of a specific attribute from the infinite attributes of God, of space and of thought. Number seven, proposition seven, the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. So God's thinking and acting are only one and the same because whatever comes from God follows from the idea of God. So the processes by which we actually arrive at thought or at, a, at an idea, we go through thought and the process of existing in space that we in, in our bodies mirror one another because they are both of God's will and they both originate from the same point. Number eight, if we have an idea of something that doesn't exist, it exists in the infinite idea of God, and so is um, an attribute of thought. If I imagine a monkey on Pluto that doesn't necessarily exist, it never has, perhaps it never will, but it is certainly a possibility physically, but the fact that it exists in my mind demonstrates is sign enough that it can belong to the infinite possibility of God's own thought or thought originating from God. So it belongs to the infinite idea of God. Okay, proposition nine. The idea of something existing has God for a cause, not because God is infinite, but is the basis for the infinite chain of ideas that are caused by other ideas. So what does he mean here? Well, he means that therefore every individual idea has for its cause another idea. So an idea comes from another idea. That is to say that God, insofar as God is affected by another idea, while uh, of this or thinking of the second idea, we can say that God is the cause, not necessarily because God thought of the idea. We, you know, we thought of the idea. I thought of an idea. Maybe you thought of an idea. 
but we can attribute God as the cause because God is the originator of this possibility of thought that follows down through cause and effect to have arrived at this point. So number 10, proposition 10. The being of substance does not imply existence of humans. Like I said before many times, there can be an essence to humanity. It doesn't necessarily mean that all humans will exist. Simple enough. Number 11. Our first thought as humans is the, the idea of an individual thing actually existing in the world. So what he's saying here is that as humans, our capacity for thought has to first go through the ringer of experiencing things in the world in order to furnish our minds with ideas that we can use to then create new ideas, to create new thoughts. We are not born with the capacity for thought because we don't have any, we only think through language or images, right? So if you actually, as a thought experiment, you tried to think without words or without images, I'd be very curious what you came up with, let me know. But what that means is that we must first have a relationship to the world, the physical world that we inhabit, before we can have a relationship with our mind as the creator of new ideas in the act of thinking or as thought, like to be able to have thought. So anything, or sorry, moving on to number 12. So anything that happens in the object of the idea of the mind, which is the body, which is the, the vessel of the mind, anything that happens in the body must be cognizable by the mind, which is to say that both mind and body are expressions of God's nature, and you cannot separate the two. There must be some degree of connection between them. Otherwise, things that happen in the world that happen to you would just be uncognizable. You wouldn't be able to think about them. You wouldn't be able to make sense of them. Or if you were making sense of things that your body didn't understand, that would also create a bad situation for you. That sounds horrifying. But yeah, so that's that's what he says. There's There's a confluence between the mind and the body that he's stressing here. Now here we get with the 13th proposition, a longer one. So we're going to talk about this one for uh, probably a couple minutes. Okay, proposition 13. The object of the idea constituting the human mind is a body. So let me repeat that again. The object of the idea, uh, so we're talking about a physical object here, of the idea constituting the human mind is a body. The body is an object that constitutes, uh, or is the body, is the object of the idea that constitutes the human mind. So what this is to say is that the mind and the body are connected, which I've already said many times, but this is his formal, the formal moment he lays it out. So there are some axioms here that we have to get into. If mind and body are united, this means that axiom one, bodies are either in motion or they are in rest, or he's adding this, bodies are either in motion or in rest. Simple enough, either a body is not moving or it's moving. Axiom two, all bodies move, some quicker, or slower than others. Fair enough. Okay, now some additional points are that bodies distinguish based on motion and rest and not in respect to substance. So what he's saying here is that bodies are determined by their motion, not necessarily by their substance. Uh, another point that he adds is that all bodies agree in some respect because they are all of same attribute of extension. So there is a harmony among different bodies in that they all are expressions of God's infinite extension. So this, what he's opening up here is really an acknowledgement. We're trying to get past what he perceives to be as insignificant differences and to instead find what is universal among us. So by acknowledging our mutual relationship to God as being expressions of God's infinite extension, you know, infinite as being an infinite thinking thing, and we have those capacities, then we can acknowledge our mutual stake in, in cultivating these aspects of ourselves to better uh, encourage our relationship with God or to better synchronize ourselves with the properties of nature and of the universe, which is what science is for, what uh, like in the last text we covered of Spinoza, why it is important to improve the understanding, 
to increase our understanding of the world through science, through observation, in order to not dupe ourselves with our perceptions because they are limited, like the sun being an inch long or a foot long, whatever it looks like in the sky to you. Uh, and then, you know, we can say from that, oh, well, we actually know how big the sun is because of our new knowledge. And we constantly build upon that because it is in our interest to better understand the world and the universe. Now, another point that he provides us here, again, we're still talking about this 13th proposition about the connection of mind and body. Another point that he adds is that the motion of rest of objects always determined by other objects acting or not acting ad infinitum. So in order for an object to actually end up moving, it needs to be acted upon, which I think, I don't know, I guess he's getting this from Newton. Well, actually, no, that seems like too early. Whatever, he's getting it from, I don't know, I don't know the history of physics. He's getting it from physics. A body can only be at rest or at motion, depending on if another object has worked on it. An object won't just take the motion on its own. It needs to be acted upon in order for that to happen. But it's interesting because what acted upon the thing that acted upon it? Or if we follow this chain down all the way to the Big Bang, what came before the Big Bang? What set everything in motion you know if there were just two like you know all the energy of the universe just got condensed into a single point and then blew up where did all that energy come from in the first place you know these questions there are no answers but it just this is all just to add to what spinoza is giving us here so composite objects or bodies can be formed when many objects have come together so you can have many different, like like in the case of some planets or other, you know, celestial bodies coming together because many different asteroids bumped into one another. And asteroids are constantly hitting planets and adding to the size of planets. So we get these composite bodies. The same with just any objects on Earth. Like if, you, if things are added to something, they will become part of that thing and they will become a, like a composite object. Another point he adds here is that except if we accept the idea of composite bodies, like atoms combining to form water, for example, like two hydrogen and one oxygen, or is it two oxygen and one hydrogen? I don't know. H2O. They come together, they form water. Please, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about the chemistry and physics. So H2O, hydrogen and oxygen come together to form water. We get this composite type of material. So the meeting of different objects. Now, we don't have to think about it only as like atoms, like at the tiniest level, but just generally with bigger things too. They come together and form composite objects. So the point that he's making here is that if we accept the idea of composite bodies, like bodies that are formed from having other things come together, if a certain number of bodies are removed with the same number and kind of objects added, the original com uh, composite object will retain its nature. So if hydrogen atoms are taken away from an h2o molecule but then other hydrogen atoms are added it will still remain the same so it's like the argonauts thing is that what it's called with the boat the idea being that you know if there's a boat and and, and over time all of its parts are constant are, are being swapped out because they age and so you have to change all the nails and pieces of wood of the boat after every single part of it has been changed, is it still the same boat? Well, I think Spinoza would say yes, in that it still retains its essence, its, its very core fundamental identity, not just as a boat, but as that specific boat, which is what matters. Because even the very recognition of anything as a boat, we have to acknowledge human intervention in this process to designate something as a boat. So it, it, nothing exists as a boat just like out there in the universe. It's only a title given. It's only a way that we can understand the world. Or it's one way that we understand the world. We attribute meaning to it. We give it a name. So therefore, I think the boat remains the same, is, the, is my point. So the next point he makes is that if parts of a thing become greater or lesser proportionally, it will retain its nature. So if all the parts grow larger at the same rate proportionally, then the entire thing that those parts make, like the single thing that they comprise, will retain its nature. If different parts grow bigger than others, and you get this like mutated thing, then it will probably lose its nature. 
So the next point being then that if the parts motivate a change in direction, then so long as their motions uh, and communications, uh, it, it, it moves and communicates as before, nothing will change regarding its nature. So it doesn't matter like which direction it's moving and how fast, as long as the relationship stays the same, then it will, of all the parts, then it will retain its nature. And the next and final kind of point, and we're going to get into more, we're still here just talking about Proposition 13, the unity of mind and body. The next point here is that the individual will retain its nature, whether in motion or rest, depending if each part retain its own motion and the way it communicates. So as long as each part stays the same, then the, the whole thing will stay the same, which makes sense because then it, there's, it won't change. Now, with all of these points that he gives us here, we can extend this idea to the whole of nature as being a single individual with many different parts, which is what we said again and again and again. Nature is that totality of which everything is just a single expression of that totality. So here are some postulates specifically about that, that the, or well, with the human body in mind and thinking about still Proposition 13, mind and body unity. So the human body is composed of many complex parts. It's postulate one. Easy enough. Makes sense. Postulate two. Of these complex parts, some are fluid, some are hard, some are soft. Easy enough. Bones, tissue, we uh, lit, and then blood, like, you know, they, we, we get it. Third postulate. This body and its parts are affected in many ways by others. Other bodies, other things. Easy enough. Number four. The human body is reliant on parts for its regeneration. Seems easy enough. Number five, if fluid affects soft tissue, it leaves an imprint, which I wasn't totally sure what he meant, if it meant like the circulation of blood. But in any case, this is what he's, this is what he gives us. He, what, what is important here is the way that the body and tissue can be inscribed with another object. Here he specifies fluid. I'm not entirely sure why he focuses on that because the same could apply with any kind of physical property. Like a physical thing could also leave a mark on the body or on soft tissue. But in any case, that's what we have. Postulate number six, the human body can move and affect other bodies. So we are not, the human body is not just affected, it can also affect other things. And then here we arrive at postulate 14. That was all just, I, I said one or two minutes. I don't know why I did that. That long detour through postulate 13. Now into postulate 14. The human mind responds to and grows with the perception that must be experienced by the body. So therefore, the mind grows as the body experiences. So think back to what we said about how when you were born, you don't necessarily have thoughts or maybe even... Well, I guess you do have the capacity for thought, but you don't have thoughts. You have to experience things in the world to develop language, to develop images of things that you can then use to think. So in that respect, the mind can only grow as the body experiences things. So as the body grows. So if we accept this, then we, ha we know that the, the idea that constitutes the mind is the body. But because the body is comprised of many parts, so too is the idea of it composed of parts. Which is to say that, in, in what he is saying, is that the body is what is necessary for the mind. And because the body is comprised of many different parts, as he said before, in our long detour through uh, Proposition 13, we then know that the mind is going to be comprised of many different parts. And like... Physiologically, it certainly is. Different parts of the mind are responsible for different parts of our emotions, our emotional states, our thinking capacity, our um, receptors, the way that we know whether we're hungry or anything. The mind does lots of different things, has many different parts. And even at the idea of thinking, even at the level of thinking itself, we adapt to different circumstances. We change our capacity for thought depending on what we're thinking about. If I tie my shoes, the type of thought that I am employing in moving my fingers in such a way is going to be very different than when I'm reading Spinoza. Thought is going to be very different in these two settings. Just to give you an idea about how, you know, the mind is not a homogenous mass. Even though it does belong to kind of the homogenous mass in 
of, of all the infinite thinking being of God. Okay, Proposition 16. Bodies can only be affected by other bodies according to their natures. So this is to say that it means that as we learn of other bodies, we can learn of our own. So we can only be affected by something physical, by its existing physically and taking up space, and therefore existing according to uh, God's infinite attribute of, of extension or of space. And so any time that we engage with something that takes up space, we are learning more about that thing, we are learning more about ourselves, and our minds grow. Proposition 17. If a body is acted upon by another, the mind will contemplate that other body as the actually existing or as present, as actually existing or as present, until the body affected is affected without the external stimulation. So if somebody throws a dodgeball at me and hits me, in that moment, I'm like, this, I, like, my mind is thinking about the ball that's hitting me, and that's just all I think about. And we assume that that ball exists and it's performing that act against us until the body is affected without that thing still being there. So afterwards, I think about how that really hurt. The dodgeball hurt my face. So therefore, uh, even though the thing has gone away, so I can say that it has left a kind of imprint, which is really how, you know, it's how trauma works too. If you, if you undergo an experience that leaves a mark on you, you can't just shake it off. It will very much linger, and it, which can make it really difficult to actually heal from it afterwards. So the point here, or the added point, is that the memory of an injury or the imagined effect on us, it really reveals the, or like both of these will reveal the connection between the mind and the body. Like the mind is actually serving a, a, a pretty important function there, even if it's allowing us to remember things that we don't necessarily want to, in that it is protecting us from potentially avoiding future circumstances like that in the future, which isn't, isn't necessarily possible, but it's our mind's ability, our mind's effort to try and help us better understand the world and the risks present within it. So this puts us into Proposition 18. If the body is affected, affected by two or more things at once, upon the re recollection of one of those things, it will also conjure up the other thing that affected it. So if I'm hit, I don't I don't know what a good example is. If I am listening to, um, I, what's what's a band? My God! If I'm listening to Taylor Swift, as I get hit in the face with a dodgeball, the next time I hear Taylor Swift, there's a good chance I'm going to be reminded of getting hit in the face with a dodgeball. That's all he's saying here is that if there's more than one stimulation at a given point, by being exposed to that stimulation later you will also recall the other things present in that moment. So that's why people can have negative associations with things that are on their own, not really harmful, like Taylor Swift's music isn't, doesn't hurt me. But if I associate it with the memory of getting hit with the dodgeball, I don't know why these are my examples I'm giving you, but in any case, then I will create this association. Okay, proposition 19. The mind doesn't know the body as a body but just knows it through ideas of modifications by which the body is affected. Because the mind, the idea of like a singular body, despite all of the value we've attributed to it through the development of the human sciences and we've better understood it, and seeing it as this unitary total thing, what Spinoza is saying here instead is that our mind's ability to actually comprehend our bodies is not our mind having a natural idea about what bodies are, but instead our mind being aware of a thing called space and the possibility of things existing in space and taking up space, that we can then come to understand them. And if we actually looked at a body, it's going to have many different attributes. We just, for simplicity's sake, when we talk with one another, we just say the body and we know what, we, you know, we know what we're talking about. But really, when our mind, we, we have to be trained to think of this thing as like a single individual total thing, just because uh, otherwise it'd be too difficult to like talk about it or to have to develop a science around it. If you were like, no, we have to think of the finger as like one part of the body and we have to treat it as this unitary thing on its own, this complete thing on its own, that would make actually developing a science and knowledge of it difficult. 
But it's important to keep that in mind that the mind doesn't necessarily understand what a body is on its own. The mind is only capable as per its adoption of God's infinite attributes can only be aware of space and extension in space as belonging to God's, uh, I guess, God's infinite attributes. The body is just a word we, we use to make understanding this specific thing in the world, in the universe possible. Okay, number 20. Sorry if there's noise, by the way. I do my best to make it quiet, but there's a construction and stuff. Number 20, God has both knowledge of human mind and body. So this is to say that God contains an idea of itself in thought, along with knowledge of its modifications and every possible modification, every single mode, like every single type of body that can exist in nature, because they have to exist according to God's laws, according to nature's laws, I should say, and God's, God and nature's laws. So God contains the knowledge and we aren't, I'm using that term very loosely here, not to say that God is like this thinking thing, like a human thinking, the big white beard, none of that. Instead, thinking about it as the totality of all natural possibility and every modification only existing in accordance with those laws of nature. So God's idea of all these possibilities, all modifications what Spinoza says here now in Proposition 21 is that this idea is part of the mind just as much as mind is part of the body. Both are united as attributes of, of God's attributes, both mind and body. So they can grasp each other in that respect and are dependent upon one another. Okay, Proposition 22. The human mind perceives both the body's modifications and the ideas of these modifications. That is because the mind is of God. The ideas of modifications are possible, and so, therefore, are ideas, because God has the knowledge or idea of the human mind. So everything is of God. Everything uh, can come to us in our minds because it is of God, and so we can make sense of the body, its modifications, and the ideas of these modifications as well. Proposition 23. Just as the mind does not know the body, it does not know itself except through its perception of the ideas of the modifications of the body. So the mind can only have a relationship with itself almost by mediating itself through the body as acknowledging its place, it's how it is tethered to, intimately connected with the body. So because knowledge of body's modifications and affectations resonates with the mind, he says that a knowledge of these ideas will necessarily involve a knowledge of the mind or dealing with anything in the body you have to then know the mind and vice versa okay 24 the human mind doesn't have total knowledge of all parts of the human body because that would mean that knowledge of the essence of body which only god possesses so we don't know virtually everything about it because that would mean then that all of its mysteries have gone away we try to totally understand everything but there's just a lot we don't know we don't fully grasp humanity's essence we can suggest some ideas but we don't actually know fully what its essence is because that is reserved for god that's not something that we are going to be open to because we're limited as humans we only perceive the world as like one single expression of god's total knowledge and you know we think the world similarly we don't have that capacity to fully grasp human essence okay proposition 25 Idea of modification of the human body doesn't mean having knowledge of external body. That is because only God can have this knowledge. Sim simple enough. I mean, you, you know, you don't necessarily know the properties of any other external body unless it is you and you've like studied it. But the idea here being that that's only open to God who would have total knowledge of everything. Number 26. Mind only perceives external bodies as existing through the ideas of the modifications of its body. So in cases where the mind imagines another body, its knowledge will be limited. You can't know everything about that other body because it, you know, it's not your own. It's really it's for God to know really fully. And we would only approach something, as he says, through the modifications of our own body by understanding ourselves and our own bodies. 
which is like informs you know why people create things not necessarily according to what would be best for all of humanity but instead just best for themselves they will design the height of doorknobs to be a certain height not of course considering how some people can't necessarily access doorknobs at certain heights the dials on an oven will be put behind the burners which if somebody is not tall enough to actually reach across that can be very difficult instead of having the burners right at the front of the oven you know it just things like that and these are just examples to demonstrate that we see things through our own experience in the world which is a problem he'll come to identify this as being a problem and part of our goal is to acknowledge our common experience and to then move away from this hyper individualism in favor of a more communal understanding of the world and each other but that's just what he's saying here is that we're going to be limited in understanding others just because we will understand them through the prism of our own experience okay number 27 idea of modifications of the human body does not involve an adequate knowledge of the human body so we don't need to have a perfect idea about the human body or like adequate knowledge knowing all of the properties of a triangle how the triangle is replicable like what makes a triangle a triangle we don't need to know all of that to understand a human body we just have to know its modifications which we actually can know because we exist in that realm of modifications of the single universal human essence or of of god's infinite extension i should say not human essence ignore that okay number 28 ideas of modifications to the human body are not clear and distinct but confused to the mind that is to say there are little conclusions without or there these are like conclusions without premises so the mind perceives things has the capacity to perceive these modifications but it doesn't necessarily know what the essence is why these modifications exist the way they do and so on we just know they exist and so the mind is naturally confused by them and is always trying to grapple with them to understand them to sit with them hence the point that they are like conclusions that premises we've just arrived at this final point seeing these things not necessarily knowing why they exist or establishing what purpose they fully serve to our mind that puts us here into proposition 29 ideas of ideas of modifications of body do not supply us with an adequate knowledge of the human mind so we can't actually arrive at this adequate knowledge of the human mind understanding how the mind works what is the nature of thought itself by looking at the human body and its modifications developing ideas from its modifications proposition 30 we can barely know how long our bodies will last so duration of bodies not established by essence everyone like we all have a common human essence but people live longer than others different amounts of time but by existence and the ways other things act upon bodies and so the duration will will depend upon the common order of nature and the constitution of things so if you live in a world that is likely there are a lot of potential harms a lot of potential risks like in a war war time setting then chances are your likelihood of survival is going to be lower if you live in a society where i don't know medical care has gotten to the point of extending life to 200 years then you know you'll live that long and it's there there are all these things to consider okay 31 we can barely know how long other bodies will last i guess this is the same point like we don't know how long we're going to live we don't know how long others are going to live number 32 all ideas insofar as they are related to god are true this point is obviously true because you just assume here that for spinoza god is absolutely true and if god is absolutely true then of course everything from god is true because god is true that's just and everything god does is proper and right like so the sentence is it satisfies itself okay proposition 33 if an idea is false it cannot be positive in its description of something it would just be an illusion so if an idea is false it like if i were to design a building like an architect and something i i did the wrong math something is just wrong in it it is not actually producing something even in imagination and in reality because that thing can never actually come into existence whereas if it was a proper drawing with proper math and uh, blueprints and everything 
then it was it would be a true idea and it could actually create something real in the world it could be positive in that way in that it'll produce something instead of negative and it's not producing anything so simple enough and otherwise it would just be an illusion It'd be like a cartoon it doesn't need to comply with reality but it, you know it's, it can live in our minds it can be entertaining but it's not positive it's not creating something number 34 every perfect idea is true and that's because like any perfect idea simply complies with god's essence number 35 falsity comes from lack of knowledge so for example like we can totally embrace our perceptions but we would then be led astray by the size of the sun for example or by anything else so we arrive at falsity when we rely too heavily upon false ways to actually measure the world like our perceptions like our eyesight for example and this is where falsity comes from now moving from this proposition 36 suggests that uh, for something to be true or false or true or false ideas these are ideas that are cut from the same cloth in that they are both of the mind so both a true or false idea exist in the mind and are arrived at from the mind where false ideas come from a lack of knowledge true idea from proper knowledge so only true ideas can actually comply with god whereas false ones are just individual creations they are just the poor use of understanding of knowledge to arrive at a point and it doesn't actually work okay proposition 37 no individual thing shares the essence with everything on its own which is to say that that would mean if the thing disappeared so would everything else so my essence is not the same as humanity's or everything else's is not the same as everything else's essence so these two things are not um coextensive an individual thing can die while the essence continues on and there are new things like it that emerge okay proposition 38 all things that belong to all parts and the whole can only be adequately conceived so this is to say that if something is common it must be adequately known by god and so can be grasped by our minds because if something is universal of course it must like we have to understand it adequately we must have a full idea of it coming from god proposition 39 the mind will have adequate knowledge of what is common to all bodies even those external so <sighs> bad time to say it. i said this in the last episode but when i'm going through these uh propositions i'm not necessarily reading them all word for word because sometimes they make no sense and so i'm adapting them so that they'll make sense so if you're reading it you're like oh that's not that's not exactly what he says this is my way of explaining it in 21st century language as to what he means because otherwise it's like you know 17th century dutch translated to english it does it, you know it has a certain old-timey feel to it and you can hear that this is how i describe things so <laughs> my vocabulary is very strong as you can tell anyways proposition 39 the mind will have adequate knowledge of what is oh yeah common to all bodies and it's external yeah, yeah yeah number 40 sorry if an idea sprouts from an adequate idea in the mind it is adequate so if an idea comes from an already adequate idea then it must be adequate so if an idea is adequate we are saying that in the infinite intellect an idea exists of which god is the cause so anything that comes from that that is a true idea must then be adequate okay now he goes on a little tangent so you know it's, okay so far we've been using language uncritically for the purpose of conveying these broader truths however spinoza is clear I want to emphasize this Spinoza is clear that when we use terms like humans or humanity we are revealing our mind's limitations we are erasing the differences between each person like we're, like I said earlier we're just using the term like bodies or humans very general way to facilitate our communicating about them but in doing so we erase the differences between each person and you know within each person which is like you know you could see Deleuze and Guattari's uh the influence that Spinoza had on them in their plea you don't need to know Deleuze and Guattari to understand well anyways if you don't understand this point then go listen to the episodes I've done on Deleuze and Guattari but as they say at the beginning of a thousand plateaus I believe they're like we uh since we are both multiple writing this book 
was, you know, we were quite a crowd. The idea being that they, neither of them see themselves as these individual people. Instead, they see themselves comprised of many different people, many different identities. And we all are. We all act differently in different settings. We uh, adopt different language in different settings, different way of talking with one another. From day to day, we can hardly claim to be the same people. We uh, we constantly, we, we are always undergoing changes as I hit the desk. Nice. Now, we make our lives easy by just referring to humans or bodies to, to make our lives easier, to just better understand them, because otherwise we can't understand all the little individual parts at once. Now, this is true even of those transcendental terms like being, like a thing, like something, substance, you know, we even understand, we do the same thing there. So we can have knowledge of vague experience, uh, like there are different ways in which we can grapple with things in the world through four different possible routes, or sorry, three different routes, or no, wait, sorry, it is four, but the first one doesn't count. So we can have knowledge of the world, even though we will always try to make our lives easy by grouping knowledges together, grouping things together to understand them. So there are four different ways that we can actually acquire knowledge through the world. The first one doesn't count, and he just writes it off immediately, but that is to have knowledge through vague experience, like just experiencing things in the world, which he's he doesn't think that's a, actually a good route to arrive at knowledge. We have to do experiments, observe, test hypotheses, and so on for him. The second... Uh, and we can also get, we you know, through imagination, we can arrive at vague experience. Like we can imagine possibilities, but they aren't grounded in reality. The second uh, type of knowledge is arrived at through reason, which is common knowledge of properties of things. The third is the intuitive science and is universal application of knowledge of God's attributes. Oh, did I say there were four? Oh, God. No, there are three. And the first one that I said, vague experience still doesn't count. Two, uh, the second one, reason. And the third one, intuitive science, are the legit forms of knowledge acquisition. Sorry, I'm... Ah, it gets confused. So the first one doesn't count for him, but the second and third are necessary to actually arrive at truth. So that brings us into Proposition 41, where he says that vague experience, the first kind of knowledge that he presented here, isn't actually knowledge at all. It is actually just a source of falsity, of illusion. Whereas 2 and 3, which are reason and then intuitive sciences, are, and intuitive sciences are referring to the application of the knowledge of God's attributes. Knowing that, God's attributes being extension, being thought, these two are our attributes our avenue to truth and to knowledge. Okay, so Proposition 42, knowledge only from two and three, reason and then intuitive sciences, supplies us with the capacity to discern truth from falsity, which is obvious, as we know what false thing comes from illusion. Yeah. 43, if someone possesses a true idea, they are aware of it, and it can't be doubted. So... Otherwise, we would have no capacity to acknowledge truth at all. We must be able to acknowledge truth when we have been confronted with it. And this signals to us that we have this capacity to discern true ideas from false ones. Number 44, reason perceives things as necessary, not as contingent. If we perceive something as necessary, then we are understanding the way by which it actually came into existence and for what purpose which is the actual application of reason for Spinoza. Whereas if something is contingent, then it, all we know about it is that it might have just happened coincidentally, which of course doesn't happen. All that reveals to us is that we don't actually have a full grasp of that thing. We don't know why it came about, how it came about, or anything like that. And so if you focus on the, an object being contingent as being dependent on other things, this is only to focus on... Uh, like the immediate physical properties of the everyday, your immediate experiences in the world, instead of focusing on eternal qualities of things. Number 45. Every idea of anything involves the eternal and infinite essence of God, 
and that is because all things are of God. Here, by existence or things existing, he means its possibility from the infinite time and possibilities supplied to us by God and by nature. Number 46. Each idea involves God's eternal and infinite essence, and so is always adequate and perfect. So what he's saying here is that the idea must be perfect because it is an attribute of God's mind, or of mind, contemplating itself as it contemplates God as the infinite intellect. So they are connected to one another. The mind has the capacity to acknowledge its place along this trajectory of God's total uh, infinite mind, infinite thinking attribute. Number 47, the mind has knowledge of an eternal and infinite essence of God. We perceive ourselves and our external bodies. Hence, we have knowledge of God through its domain. When we see the world, all the infinity of the universe, if it, Spinoza again, assuming it's infinite, but we are confronted with this infinite possibility, time being infinite, it might be infinite, who knows? Uh, we have to, we are then acknowledging God's eternal and infinite essence. Number 48, mind is not free, but is subject to endless chain of cause and effect. So the mind doesn't have like all thoughts that come to the mind are only permitted by what you've learned previously. You are going to be limited then by what you have learned previously, what causes have produced the effect of your thinking. And the same with bodies. There's nothing that happens in the physical world that cannot be attributed to a cause. If there was, that thing would have broken free from the chain of cause and effect and would be like the first moment. It's like the Big Bang. Like the Big Bang might be the first moment, which is wild. Like how does a first moment actually come from nothing. That puts us here into number 49. In the mind, only the idea can affirm or negate. So we must have the idea of a triangle, for example, to confirm its properties. So only in the mind can an idea can, uh, affirm or negate, which is obvious because your bodies can't do that, I assume, or just extending through space. You don't have that capacity, but so the mind does this. And then before concluding this part and getting into part three, he gives us a few notes on will, with the, like will, to will something. So number one, we all operate by the will of God alone, which is, again, not the idea is not that God is sitting on a cloud and God is thinking, what do I think will should be like? Will is tantamount with nature's properties and laws. Number two, the second point on will. All things happen according to God's plan, and so we must learn to wait for and bear each form of fortune. So his point here is saying, like, if, you, if you're poor, get over it. This is God's plan. If someone's rich, don't be upset with them. They did nothing wrong. They're just living according to God's plan. Which, um, if any of you have any idea about me, you're going to know I'm not going to like that. But in any case, this is what he, so what he's saying. Number three. So we must never hate anyone because if you hate someone, it means you hate something of God's kingdom, the entire kingdom of nature's properties. And what you're saying then is that you are dissatisfied with God, which Spinoza thinks is wrong. And finally, number four of the notes on will, this should guide us in how we establish government so as to permit people to act according to nature's laws and properties. Which you might say, oh, well, David, I thought you said that Spinoza was advocating for community against hyper-individualism. And that is true. But he still thinks that every person's first task is to provide for themselves, understand themselves, and to allow themselves to act and to live in such a way as to permit their ability to act as easily as possible in the world. And the only way to really, or one of the only ways to do that is to help permit that for others around you. So you help others. You establish community and government to foster this type of cooperation in order to allow individuals to live their best lives. But we'll get into that more as we go on. And that's, we're going to wrap that up there. The end of part two. Next time we're on to part three on the origin and nature of the emotions. We're going to talk about love and sorrow and everything like that. And yeah, if there's anything I got wrong, anything I missed, I'd love to hear about it. Tell me what you think. Do you buy it? Do 
you like what Spinoza is giving us here, uh, I'd love to hear all your thoughts. But yeah, on that note, take care.